I think small and large classes both have their benefits depending on the course material. Some want to make big classes feel small. I want my small classes to feel big in order to maximize alienation. I think small classrooms um, are better than large classrooms just because you can form better connections with other students and it allows the professor to guide conversations about texts to the interests of the students in the class. I like small classes more because it helps me feel more connected to the content, the peers, and the professor. I like small classes because I can't skip them. <laughs> Hi, this is Sam, and this week on our engagement podcast, we talk all about big classes versus small classes, what you find more engaging, what we find more engaging. Join us as we discuss. Small and large classrooms. Which are better? What do the students prefer? Let's find out with Engage With Us. You are listening to the Steely Podcast. Engage with us. All students considered. (laughs) STLI Podcast, all students considered. My name is Sam. I'm Bethany. I'm Jess. I'm Zario. I'm Jada. I'm Ryan. And today we will be talking about large classes versus small classes. How do they infect engagement with both material and in class? Um, Starting off our questions, uh, we'll talk about assignments and reading. In a large class, do you find yourself engaging more with the material or do you kind of skimp on the reading, maybe just skim it, maybe not even open the file? In my experience, most of my large classes have been STEM classes with uh, those pesky problem sets. So in terms of engagement, I would say not particularly. I do um, outsource a lot of the problems and see how fast I can get it done just because it feels very um, run of the mill to me, just something that I need to get done. But however, with some of my smaller classes, they're usually humanities type classes, and it's a lot easier for me to really engage with the reading and try to really participate in class and figure out like what the teacher's trying to get it out of us. So yeah, I feel like for me, specifically humanities classes and the smaller ones are a lot easier to engage with. I can kind of um, piggyback off that because I also take STEM classes and I can just admit I do not read the readings in those um, classes like if it's not required for the test um, sometimes I'll like skim through it if I you know just look for some words but with my smaller classes I feel like I do have to do the readings only because it's like less of us and so we have to communicate with the professor and answer the questions um, in those smaller classes. So I'm more likely to do the readings and um, assignments in the smaller classes. I think that it's the same for me in the sense that smaller classes, you obviously there's more of like a discussion, you wanna be prepared, you don't wanna, you don't wanna be the only one who isn't partaking in the conversation. But there, I, there's instances where I've been in large classes where the professor likes to just look at the attendance sheet and like calls on somebody So there's instances where I will read. I do like understanding the content before attending, so I probably just like skim it a bit. Uh, But it does really depend. Sometimes I like the reading, so I do the reading, but it just depends on the course for me. Wow, okay. So what I'm hearing is that you're reading out of fear of cold (laughs) calls. That sounds so stressful. I'm glad I haven't had that experience. Wow. It is scary because you don't want to be there like, uh, sorry, I didn't do the thing in front of your <laughs> yeah. buddies. So yeah. in those classes, it's nice to just have like a basic understanding of the reading. As long as you can say one or two things, the fresh is like, yay, good job. And you're like, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think the cold calling is brutal. It's happened to me a few times and... Sometimes you're like a deer in headlights, like, a oh, damn, I didn't read. <laughs> um, but other times you kind of like, are like, okay, I did this reading. That's nice. Thank you. I can show off a little bit. But it's definitely a little stressful. Um, and it really depends on the class and how detailed you want to make it, how detailed you want the reading to be, um, and how much you actually engage with it. If it's not going to help you on a midterm or a paper or anything, it's not super worthwhile to even devote like an hour of your time to sitting down and reading something that's not going to interest you at all. 
Yeah, for me, and especially in a larger class, if there's not a grade attached to an assignment, it's very hard to be motivated to actually do it. Because in a large class, you're largely anonymous anyways. So why, why would you do a bunch of extra work that's not going to affect your final resort in the, result in the course? Yeah, maybe sidebarring off of that with all of these recommended, quote unquote, um, optional readings and assignments. Why do these professors think that we have all this time to be doing, first of all, the required assignments, and then on top of that, recommended ones? Like, where are those? Like, don't just give you one recommended. There's like a whole file, like, here's five recommended. Yeah. Like, yes, let me take the time. <laughs> but I feel like um, some professors have kind of like caught on to students not reading them. Because have you guys heard of Perusal? Yeah. Or uh, used it? Yeah. Um, it's like a website where they put the readings on there so they can see if you've looked at the reading at all. So mm. some not of my, checking me. Oh yeah, my some <laughs> of my professors have started using that. So I, like, you know, sometimes you can't get rid of, like, get away with not looking at the reading mm. anymore. So This is the kind of situation where you just got to open it on your laptop and walk away. Yeah. <laughs> supposed to say, this is the Steely Podcast engage with us yeah correct okay <laughs> this is the steely podcast engage with us find it hard to talk to your students start with us we've talked a lot about assignments um well let's talk about how they differ from class to class especially within departments um humanities non-humanities and stem um and also in terms of size of the class. Large classes seem to have more rigid formatted exams while smaller classes, in, at least in my experience, have been more freeform writing type assignments. Um, has anyone had any experiences with that going from class to class with a lot of differentiation kind of catching up with that? Yeah, we've been saying before that um, a lot of us feel like a lot of the smaller classes sort of tailor the um, assignments to what the students want and the types of things that the students are really interested in. I find that in my larger like lecture style classes, the teacher will really stick to a very strict like calendar of what the assignment is, when it's due, like what you have to do. Like maybe um, every once in a while they'll drop a grade if like some people have done really bad or like some people have, haven't gotten to it. But I feel like in a lot of my very smaller humanities classes, the teacher is always very welcome to bringing in student input on like what we want to read or like like what kind of assignments we want to do or like every humanities class I've had so far at the very beginning of the semester my teacher has been like all of this on the syllabus is very TBD like it could change at some point I'll never add readings uh, for the most part we'll probably see some taken away depending on how the semester goes so yeah for me at least it's been the smaller classes that have been a lot more flexible and tailored towards the students needs. I also think that smaller classes, there's more of a sense of creativity. There's more like m different modes used. It's not just um, tests, whereas bigger classes have done the standardized, like multiple choice tests, and then the professor just has to get it automated or whatever. But the smaller classes, there's like presentations, or there's podcasts, or just short videos. So I feel like there's more sense of like freedom and how you want to be graded or how your final result ends up being. I agree. Um, the smaller classes that I've been in is definitely a lot of presentations um, coming into class. There's like moments where my professor would be like, okay, everybody stand up and just tell me how you felt about the assignment we had to do or about the reading that we had. So it's definitely more personal and engaging um, in the smaller classes, whereas majority of my big classes is just exams. You might do a PowerPoint or a paper, but that's really it. And I mean, I do like not really having to do a whole bunch of presentations, but it really depends on the class. Like for my harder STEM classes, I'm fine with that, like just a test and maybe a PowerPoint or a paper. Um, for like smaller classes, I did creative um, writing. And so, you know, that's a lot of writing and presentations. And it was actually fun. Like I thought it was gonna be a lot of work. So it really depends on the class, whether or not like I like having the workload or not really having anything. This is kind of going off of what everyone said, but especially Jada, like the the smaller classes are going to be more flexible because the professor kind of gets to know you. And if you're like, 
hey, I know that we're supposed to do like a paper on this, but could I do this instead? Like they're going to be more willing to work with you on that um, and work to make an assignment fit how you're best able, how you're able to produce your best work rather than a professor who's like, I don't have time to do that for you um, in a large class for like every single student. Oh, I was going to ask you a question real yeah, quick, just for everyone. Um, I was just wondering, like, how everyone's able, like, what is y'all's take on in your either bigger or smaller classes when it comes to, like, getting extensions? Extensions. Or, like, do you guys feel like it's the same in each of the types of classes, or do you have, like, more leeway in the smaller class, more leeway for in the For me, um, like, in my big STEM classes, like, there are extensions, but they're very strict. Like, it's either, like, you have... Um, you you're allowed one day late and that's it or you're allowed like two days if you're sick or have an excuse and then that's it but for humanities like if you're just like really busy that week like it might be week before finals and you just have a lot of stuff going on I feel like the humanities professors are a lot more accommodating to like your needs and like extensions and like giving you more time especially since like not digging on people who teach big classes but it's just a lot easier to accommodate smaller classes like you can't give a whole 200 person class extensions every time they ask for it so yeah some takeaways I know we've been digging on larger classes sometimes but they're honestly impossible to avoid sometimes and they're really built and structured to be not very accommodating and not very suiting towards the students or the faculty's needs to be honest but I feel like in terms of fixing that um, if you have the ability to have a lot of TAs or the ability to like maybe lower the assignments and really get to know your students, get to know their assignments and maybe even have office hours, get to know them personally and give them feedback personally, I think that goes a really long way for all of students. And also even if there's a lot of classes where there's just a very strict materialist and you have to get through A, B, and C within a certain time, I feel like you can faculty can maybe try a little harder to bring some creativity in it like if you need to do a project where you need to understand the first functionality of a certain drug group I'm sorry that may, made no sense but I'm in or go to right now so that's what came to mind you can maybe ask the students to pick a certain drug that they like and give a presentation on it or something that'll just bring any kind of creativity out of the students and something that'll make you learn more about them I think another good way is maybe in, incorporate more like group work so that instead of having to grade seven assignments you have one that is a part of like seven students who it makes your workload easier and it also allows students to, like talk and have that conversation um i know it might be hard with a large class but it would kind of lower the look word workload for everybody including the professor so that could be a good idea no i definitely agree with that um i think like having like pre-established groups, um, whether that's in a more casual sense or, you know, from the professor, um, from the beginning of that in larger classes can really be helpful. Um, just so you can kind of find support within that class and you have other people kind of holding you accountable. Um, I know I took a class my freshman year. It was a chem lecture. I don't know why I did that. I'm a humanities major now, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but really the only reason that I was able to pass that class was because I found friends in that class, people who would study with me, who would explain things to me. Um, and I would not have been able to do, do that unless I kind of took action myself. So I think having a group is really something that um, makes it uh, feel more supportive, more like a smaller class. Mm -hmm. And then also with taking action myself, um, something I had to do with my larger classes is just going ahead and reaching out to the professor because in my smaller classes like, I feel like there's already that connection that's made within the class with the professor but in the bigger classes you know there's like so many people so it feels like there's no bond already so I've had to learn to just go ahead and walk up to the professor after class each time or go ahead and email them multiple times to go ahead and establish some sort of relationship so that I can feel like I'm actually gaining something out of that larger class. Um, hi, my name is James. I'm a senior here, and um, I'm a public policy major and econ minor. I think my biggest thing would be that the small classes are very intimate, and the large classes remind me of online Zoom classes, and I had a very negative 
um, feeling towards those classes because I felt like there wasn't a very personal relationship between you and the professor and it was very difficult to meet your classmates. Um, and so I think that alone reminds me of that and so there's kind of a bad stigma there. Yeah, the, the, the big classes that I've had that have multiple or um, very engaged TAs I found have been actually very engaging um, because they actually help connect the students to the material even when the professor maybe can't handle all 300 or 200 students. So chopping it down into smaller bits and pieces with three, two, four um, TAs can really help make it feel more intimate. You are listening to the S T L I. What is that spell? Steely! You are listening to the Studio for Teaching and Learning Innovations podcast. All students considered. Engage with us. Welcome back to the Silly Podcast. My name is Sam Vito, and I'm here with Mike Bloom. Today we're talking about the book Distracted by James Lang. Welcome back to the Steely Podcast. Today with me I have one of our higher-ups, Mike Bloom. <laughs> and you wanted me to read this book, two chapters of it at least. Um, and the two topics that were really brought up in it were the communities of attention and curious attention. Do you want to talk more maybe about the book and about these topics? Yeah, that, I, I would love to do that. Um, so one of the things about this book, Distracted by James Lang, um, is that he posits a question uh, that students have always been distracted. How can we um, create opportunities for them to uh, connect? Because, you know, being distracted, being out of sync with what's going on in the class can really hinder your ability to learn. Without, without focus, without attention, um, you kind of lose the whole thing. So how do we get students on board right from the beginning and make them um, you know, enjoy the class, want to be there and be attentive in the class? Um, so the chapters that I thought were really appropriate were the communities of attention and the attentive curiosity chapters. Um, do you have any observations about those chapters? Like, what does a community of attention mean to you when you read mm -hmm. that book? What does that mean in the context of a classroom? Sure. So we can bring this back to the large versus small classrooms, too. Um, the first chapter, chapter four of the communities of attention, it talks a lot about the power of names and how attention orients itself to other humans. And in large classes, that kind of names... The, the idea of names isn't so much brought up. It's just very, like, lecture-based. There's no interaction between the faculty and the students. And I think this really points to the fact that the students will be more successful if their names are brought up and if they do have a chance to speak with the faculty member. And they gave an example of one faculty member, I forget who what the name of, her, but um, that's ironic considering that we're talking about names. <laughs> Just kidding, Sam. <laughs> oh <my. laughs> but I, I think when it talks about her class, she does do a great job, even in a big class, of asking questions, posing questions to the students, and having personalized, pointed questions where everyone has an opportunity to speak. Um, can and can you describe a little bit about what that entails? Like, what example is that that she gives? Uh, she's, it says in the book that community must be continually reinstated, that posing these questions and having that opportunity for students to speak keeps fostering a community where they do feel comfortable and it is more attentive. Um, I mean, do you want to speak on the power of names and, the <laughs> and how that might apply well, more for directly me. to classes? Like, it's obviously applicable in the smaller classes, but in the bigger classes, I feel like people get lost in them. Right. So there is this um, idea, if you're in a bigger class, that there's some comfort maybe in anonymity. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you may not want to have, it, it's really difficult, I think, to create community, much more difficult to create community in a larger class than it is in a smaller class. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, there are things that, that you can do with names to um, stress that. Uh, naming is super powerful, um, right? So... 
if you're going to take a look at mythology, you have Odysseus, who he's there in the cave of the Cyclops, Polyphemus, and he calls himself nobody, right? Mm -hmm. And he's able to escape right. from, and it's his anonymity that does that. He can escape because he remains anonymous. But then what is it? It's his ego, it's his hubris at the end as he's leaving shore, and Polyphemus is there, and, you know, he's angry because he poked out his one good <laughs> eye. And what does Odysseus do? He says, I can't, I can't take it anymore. I'm going to tell him my name. And he says... You know who screwed you over? It was Odysseus. <laughs> and that's when Polyphemus has power over him. He mm -hmm. now gets to, you know, ask his father, Poseidon, to screw with Odysseus. And that sets him on this long journey, the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. Right? So names are super powerful, but, you know, taking ownership of your name, uh, feeling that, you know, you want people to call you by your name is, is, you know, a little fraught sometimes. It can take you from the anonymous into the community, whether or not you want it. So there's got to be more than just naming students, right? right? There's got to be doing something with that name, making sure that you have a personal connection with that person. Larger classes, you know, you could do that in small groups, have students in smaller groups kind of know each other's names. And we often suggest that in larger classes that you break it into groups. Let's say you have a group of, uh, let's say you have a class of 50 students. Break that into a group of, into 10 groups of five for discussion. Uh, make sure that they know each other's names. Make sure that they have a discussion board maybe where they learn each other's names. And so not only is it important for the faculty member to know all the students' names, especially in a large class, but it's important for students to know each other's names and to know at least some of their colleagues' names, how to reach them outside of class, those kinds of things. And before we move on to curious attention, um, using technology in the large classrooms, especially like things like Poll Everywhere and those more interactive softwares that everyone can participate in, do you think that's a practical way to build community in a larger class, or does that seem to substantiate the power of the anonymity where people aren't really named, where it's just like everyone's just kind of participating, but no one really knows who's who. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really great question. There are lots of reasons to use something like Poll Everywhere in a large class. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to take any large classes mm -hmm. and, and have you used Poll Everywhere or mm -hmm. have you done those kinds of things? Yes, I have. And it still somewhat draws you in, but it's still... You, st you still are anonymous to an extent, and you don't really feel like your voice is being heard as much as it could be. Mm -hmm. So, do you do you prefer that when you're in a large class? Do you do you feel disconnected in a good way? Do you feel disconnected in a bad way, or it is what it is? When I feel disconnected, I kind of just like to escape from it. So, a lot of the large classes, if I don't find that it's noticed that I'm gone it's hard for me to get up and go to that class where it's just like, yeah, I could go, but I have like four friends in the thing and they'll send me the notes. So why would I go? That's a really good point. So the more connected you feel to that class, the more people that you, who you feel rely on you to be in that class, because you're going to be do, doing something that you can participate in, mm -hmm. that you have sort of an active opportunity to, um, to expand the learning in that class, you're probably more apt to go to a class like that. Yeah, when you have an active role, you don't really want to miss it compared to if when you just have a sitting there taking notes role. <laughs> right. you, you don't see the real upside to being there. Right. So, you know, larger classes, um, maybe break them up so that students can be in small groups together and feel that sense of a smaller community and then maybe sharing out so that they have a sense that, oh, my little community over here and that little community over he there had different ideas about something or they had the same idea about something and we're mm -hmm. connecting in that way. And that's a really powerful way to connect students in a larger class, I think.